Well, good morning, friends. And it's wonderful to come together in Jesus' name, to seek him together, to receive from him, and also to give him our praise. There are a few announcements, and uh, I would invite you to open up your bulletin to the white insert and turn to, well, there's a 7 by 7 prayer guide, and on the other side of that, there are the announcements. And uh, to begin with, I want to invite Sandy Hesterberg to come. She's got a a little bit of information for you, and as she's coming, you can look through the announcements and see things that are coming, and Sandy's got some important information for you. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning. As you can see, we have a few quilts out here that the sewing ladies have been putting together for I don't know how many years, but many, many years, and we use these quilts for... um, sometimes catastrophes, uh, sometimes as gifts. We just recently took 51 of them to Brookstone in Rantoul. We uh, also in the last two years have given them to the preschool kids, which is exciting. I have to share a little story. One of the little girls got her um, quilt and they come, we tie them up with a little bow and she will to this day, as far as I know, she has not untied that because she thinks it looks pretty the way that it is. So that's, that's, that makes us feel good. But you have, what I'm doing now is we're having an opportunity for some people to make some tops for us. We, um, we make the whole quilt ourselves, but we're going to do, um, we just need help because we can't, we have such few people on the sewing ladies group right now, and two of those ladies are in their 80s. And we just think it's time that we kind of try and bring some more people in. So we came up with the idea of making kits. And the kit is only the top to the quilt. You would get a, a bag that will have at least 63 squares in it, three different patterns of those squares, and you would sew them together. They come with instructions, so all you're making is the top. And then when you're done with the top, you bring it back to us, and we will finish it. We'll put the batting and the backing on it and sew them up so that they're ready to be given to somebody else. Also, um, you can, it's a good way that you can do two, one of two things. You can sew them together at home, or you can bring them on Mondays when we meet, and you can sew them here at the church. If you need any help at any time, we would be more than happy to help you. All you have to do is bring your kit and come by and we will show you how to do it and you are more than welcome to stay. We would love to have you stay and join us. Um, After the church service, the kits will be in the upper room. They're already set up there. All we ask is that we, we need the number of the kit that you get in your name so that down the road if we're looking for a kit and we can't find it, we know where to look. But if you have any questions, Donna Copeman and I will both be out in the upper room after the service. Thank you. Thank you again, Sandy. And uh, if you have your announcements in front of you, you can keep following along. And at this time, I'm going to invite Bill Hofschneider to come. He has an additional announcement for us today. And thank you, Bill. Well, since our pastor decided to, uh, well, I'll say it this way, it was called away. He was led away. So we're we're sorry to see him go, but uh, uh, just wanted to update you a little bit. Um, I have talked to Pastor Germstead at the AFLC, and he'd sent me some information. So we are kind of moving forward with a kind of a punch list of, of things, of a process. Um, we've got uh, a couple of couples that have agreed to uh, be on the call committee, so we'll get those approved at our next council meeting. Um, and, and really the whole process, I appreciate some, all of you who've uh, reached out maybe and whatever but uh, the next thing on that list would what they suggest was give a uh, send out a a church-wide survey to see just uh, forget how they worded it 
what you perceive to be their expectations in the next pastor's ministry in your midst. So, you know, the council kind of, the congregation is in charge, so the council answers to the congregation. So um, surveys are a little bit tough because then somebody's got to process them and do whatever. So just kind of my thoughts, and I haven't run it by the council yet, but uh, we might try and have kind of a call an informal meeting to where we could just, certain people could just voice their thoughts and whatever. Because cause honestly, I'm a little conflicted you know, as we as we end up at this point, um, you know, and maybe what our ministry should look like here at St. Paul's, what what our uh, what our leaders, you know, what should that ministry? I don't want to say chain of command, whatever, but just what what it should look like. Who, what roles should should our ministers? or pastors uh, actually play, you know, moving forward? Is there something we could do to, I don't know, just make everybody's lives more productive and better and, you know, whatever. So, um, apologize for not being the greatest spokesman, but uh, uh, if I'd have known, uh, well, I should thank my peers for electing me president. <laughs> <laughs> um, so j just know we're working on it you know I want you to be confident in, in that so um, like I say I appreciate all the kind words everybody's or some have given me to this point but uh, and, and while I'm here I guess uh, I just wanted to say you know to do this thing we call church here uh, you know it takes a lot of help from a lot of people and, you know, from, well, I guess we could start with Sunday school. You know, the faithful Sunday school teachers here every Sunday, then to get to church, you know, we got the sound techs, the videographers, and, um, you know, the altar guild, uh, the musicians. Good to see Carol back at the organ. Um, so... Yeah, I was going to say, let's just, can we just thank God, you know, as I leave with some applause for all those who serve. We just really appreciate it. Thanks. Kind of hard to follow that up, Bill. LAUGHTER <laughs> Really appreciate you, Bill, very much. Thank you for serving. Well, here we go. There's a few announcements that we need to look at, so if your sheets are still open, let's look at a few of those uh, tidbits. We want to acknowledge uh, that today, from 2 to 4 p.m., we together as a congregation, along with the Maxwell family, are celebrating uh, Dick and Bonnie's 50th wedding anniversary, and we announced that a couple weeks ago, and we clapped, but in your own way, would you just say happy anniversary to Dick and Bonnie in, in, the, in the hours to come, and, and we're looking forward to being together in the basement later on today. And you'll notice that uh, Mother's Day breakfast is coming a week from today, and so be ready for that, and be ready to celebrate your mom, and uh, maybe for you husbands like me to celebrate both your mom and uh, your wife and, and, and honor her. And uh, you can see a couple items down there below. We're, we're getting ready for the Family and Youth Bible Camp, and that is something that you can be prayerfully considering, how you would be involved in, uh, in that uh, in camp this summer. And we received an email this week that registration deadlines are coming up, and so please be in prayer. If you have questions, you could uh, see our friends, Jennifer and Brody Crozier. They're here today. You could ask them questions if you have those. And there's a few other tidbits here that are important uh, related to Sunday school. Uh, you'll see the information there about May 19th being the last day of Sunday school and our summer worship schedule beginning on June 2nd. And there's a few other tidbits there, but take a look at 
both this week at St. Paul's and see what information you need to be involved in. And with all of this in mind, would you stand with me as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father God, we acknowledge you. Above all, we acknowledge you and we thank you, Father, for how great of a salvation you've given to us. Thank you for sending your Son as the Savior of the world. And we acknowledge you, Jesus Christ, as our Savior. And thank you even this morning as we spend this time together in your presence. Thank you for making it known to each one of us again how much we need you, Jesus, how much we need your saving work in our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ministry within us today and among us and through us. Thank you, O God, for the great opportunity that we have to be together in your presence, helping each other to worship you, encouraging each other. Lord, let that be a part of what we're doing here in song, in prayer time, as we study your word together, even as we would come to your table, Jesus, and receive your body and your blood, let all of this be done for your praise and your glory. For we gather here in Jesus' name. And the saints agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing as we announce together, confessing our faith in agreement with the Apostles' Creed that's printed in your bulletin. Let's confess our faith out loud together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated together, and would you open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah as we continue together. Our first scripture reading for today is found in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 15 through 19. Isaiah chapter 30, beginning with the 15th verse. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be, and the rest of you shall be saved in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling and you said, no, we will flee upon horses. Therefore, you shall flee away, and we shall ride upon swift steeds. Therefore, your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at, one, at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee till you are left. Like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the justice of the Lord, for the Lord is God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion, in Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. Our second scripture reading is from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. Romans chapter 9, starting with the first verse. 
I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accused, accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to fl the flesh, is Christ, who is God all over, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though a word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca was conceived chil children by one man, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might be continued, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved but Esau I hated. This is the word of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Please stand as we give ourselves and our offerings to God. You may be seated together. I'd invite you to take up the seven by seven prayer guide and let's continue to 
Seek the Lord together and let's pray out loud the prayer that's at the top of the page. A prayer for us to be agreeing in this week as we go through this prayer guide during the week. Let's pray together out loud. Lord, help me to see others as souls who will spend eternity with you or apart from you. Help me to receive your promises in my life. Help me to realize that everything in my life is meant to bring you glory. Allow my life, through the help of the Holy Spirit, to bring you honor, glory, and praise. In your Son's mighty name we pray. Amen. And Lord God, we continue to pray on behalf of our church family. Right now, God, we pause and we give you thanks for each of the ones listed here, and we're asking God for your divine and powerful healing work in their lives. And so we pause now to pray in agreement on behalf of these and others in our church family, in our families, and, oh God, even our friends, hear us as we bring to you requests like these. We thank you, God, for hearing us as we pray now and as we pray throughout the week. And Lord God, even as uh, the church council president, Bill Hofschneider, stood a few minutes ago, God, we agree praying on behalf of our church council, on behalf of the call committee that will be formed. Oh God, on behalf of your congregation here, we thank you for each member. We thank you for the work, oh God, that you have been and that you will continue to do Lord, through the teaching and the preaching of your word in Bible studies, oh God, as in small groups and in relationships, in families, Lord God, in our homes, thank you for the work of your word in our lives. Thank you for the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, we're trusting that you will clarify your plans, your will, we trust, will be accomplished in and through this congregation in the seasons to come and we give you great thanks and praise for the good plans that you have for us. And Lord God, as Gary Maxwell would stand and proclaim your word, we pray that you would continue, God, to work mightily through him as you have. Do so today. And in our hearts, Lord God, work mightily, powerfully. And even now as we pray the prayer, Jesus, that you've taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord. You may turn in your hymnal to 585 and you may remain seated as we sing together.
Let's pray together. Gracious and Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we ask now that you would just help us to focus upon your word, what your truth would have to say to our hearts and to our minds. Lord, that you would give us the strength and the courage to live out your word. Lord, that you would help us to leave this place filled with the Holy Spirit, wanting to do your will and walk in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, actress Jennifer Lawrence told a story where about 10 years ago, she was at a party full of famous people, and up to her walked Elizabeth Taylor. And Elizabeth Taylor walked up to her and said, I, I just admire you as a young actress. I just saw your last film, and I think you should be nominated for an Oscar. I just love your work. And Jennifer Lawrence said, well, I just started gushing compliments back at her. I've seen all of your movies, and you're such a fashion icon, and you're such an amazing woman. And just as she's talking to Elizabeth Taylor, a friend walks by. And Jennifer Lawrence grabbed her by the arm and pulled her in and said, I want you to meet Elizabeth Taylor. And her friend leaned in and whispered in her ear, this isn't Elizabeth Taylor. And she, Jennifer Lawrence whispered, but what do you mean? She said, Elizabeth Taylor died two years ago. This isn't Elizabeth Taylor. And Jennifer Lawrence said she was so embarrassed, she ran out of the room, ran out of one of her shoes, and never went back for it. She just left the place. She was missing the most important detail. And this morning, as we look at Romans 9, Paul is talking to Israel, and he's telling them, you've missed it. You've missed the most important detail. You're missing Jesus. So turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We're going to look at the first uh, 16 verses in Romans 9, beginning at verse 1. And last week we talked about Romans 8, where Paul had all this encouragement, all these promises. And you can almost sense that Paul was tearing up with tears of joy as he wrote Romans 8. And as he writes Romans 9, you can picture Paul tearing up with tears of concern. Tears of concern for the Israelites, tears of of concern for the Jews who haven't yet accepted who Jesus is. They've missed the most important thing. And our first point this morning is Paul's concern for souls. We see at the beginning of Romans chapter 9, Paul's concern for his fellow Jews and their eternal souls. Look with me, beginning at verse 1, it says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. For they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriots, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. In most of Paul's letters, he writes to the Gentiles, but here in Romans, he's writing to the Jews. And he says, he starts off by saying, this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I am in anguish over your souls. And he says, this is the truth. I wish that I could be accursed if you could be saved. Paul says, I, would ra I wish I could be cut off so that you could have salvation. He's, concern he's concerned for their souls. And we see something echoed of that in the Old Testament. I want you to look with me at Exodus 32, 32, at the beginning of the Bible. Exodus 32, 32. And this is Moses. After the Israelites have sinned against God, Moses makes a plea to God. He says in verse 32, But now, Lord, if you will forgive their sin, if not, please blot me out of the book that you have written. Moses says for the Israelites thousands of years previous, Lord, you could blot me out of your book if you would keep them in the book of life. He's concerned for their souls. Just like Paul is here at the beginning of Romans 9. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we concerned with other people's souls in the same way? Do we have that kind of urgency that souls around us would come to Christ? 
Monday, I had a woman come into the clothing center. And she began speaking to me with tears in her eyes before she even started. And as she told this story, she, she just began crying. And, and I asked her what was wrong, and she said, my neighbor's son passed away yesterday. And she said, years ago, he was walking down the road, and he was carrying a heavy bench. And it was too heavy for him to carry, and I saw him walking, so I picked him up, and I brought him home. She said, not long after that, he went to prison for a long time. And he had finally gotten out, and he passed away last night. And she said, and this was the part that was upsetting her, I had five minutes to tell him about Jesus, and I didn't. And I have no idea where that young man is spending eternity. She was grieving that in the five minutes she was with this person. She was never with him any other time. In the five minutes she was alone with him, that she didn't mention Jesus. And she was grieved over the fact that she didn't minister to his soul. And so this morning, I would ask each one of us, do we have that kind of concern for the souls around us? And not just for uh, strangers or nameless, faceless people in the world, but for the souls of our family, for the souls of our friends, for the souls of our neighbors and our co-workers. Do we have that kind of concern where we grieve when we know that souls are spending eternity apart from the Lord? Paul says, these are my people. These are my kinsmen. These are my brothers. These are, this is my race. I want to see all of them come to know who Christ is. These are people that, he, or, that live with him in his community. He knows them. He recognizes them. And he says, Lord, if it would be so, let me be a curse that they might be saved. He's grieved for their souls. We live in a world full of lost souls. William Booth is the man who started the Salvation Army. And in the early 1900s, he published a book of visions that the Lord gave him of this world. And one of the visions given to William Booth is called the Vision of the Lost. And William Booth paints this picture in his book. He says, I looked out my window and I saw a large dark sea. And in the sea were hundreds or millions of people struggling and drowning in the waves. And it was night, and there was a large storm. Thunder was off in the distance, and lightning was cracking over and over again. And I was watching people fall into the depths of the sea. He said, meanwhile, amongst the sea was a platform. And on the platform were just a few people reaching out with ropes or with nets, trying to reach the people caught in the waves. He said, but what troubled me was there were many more on the platform who talked and laughed and danced and talked of sports and entertainment and politics. And he said, my heart grieved even more when I noticed the people on the platform seemed to know the people drowning in the sea, and it didn't concern them. He said, but among the middle of the platform was a large rock, and there were a few people climbing the top to the top of the rock and then coming back down to help those lost in the waves. And he said, what I realized was that the sea was this world, and there were many people drowning, doomed to eternity apart from Christ. He said, the thunder was the wrath of God coming in judgment, and the lightning was the illumination or the realization that I live in this lost world of people caught in the waves. He said, the platform was the word of God, and some people had it but didn't even realize that there were people struggling in the waves. They laughed and joked, and he said some of them were even talking about churches and sermons where they heard about the people in the waves but did nothing. And he said, but the rock is Christ, and we are meant to climb the rock and then come back down into the waves to help those lost souls. And that's a summary of his vision, but I wanted to conclude that illustration by giving you his exact words when it comes to reaching the lost. He says, we must do it. You cannot hold back any longer. You have enjoyed yourself in Christianity long enough. You've had enough pleasant feelings, pleasant songs, pleasant meetings, pleasant plans, 
You've had much human happiness, the clapping of hands, the shouting of praises. Now go to God and tell him that you are ready to spend the rest of your days rescuing those who are struggling in the waves. He says enough is enough. There are people struggling in the waves, souls who will spend an eternity apart from the Lord. We've, spent, we've wasted enough time. Let us start rescuing those souls in the waves. And that's Paul's point at the beginning of Romans 9 here. He realizes that his countrymen are lost souls, and it grieves him. He wants to see them saved. He wants them to realize who Jesus is and what he has done in the, for their lives. And it's the same for each one of us. This morning, does it grieve you to know that there are people separated from God right now? And if their lives were to end today, they would be separated from him for eternity. Do we have that kind of concern for souls? Our second point this morning is God's love for the world. Look with me at verses 6 through 9 in Romans 9. It says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all that are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as his offspring. For this is what the promise has said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but when Sarah is conceived, children by one man are one father, Isaac. Yet though they are born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's perfect election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who was called. Paul gives this example, and his Jewish readers would have known this, where he says, not all of Israel are of Israel. In other words, not everyone who was born in Israel are children of the promise. Not everyone who is born of Israel realizes who Jesus is and will receive the promise. He says it's not enough to be born in Israel. Not everyone of Israel will, is from Israel. And he says, God has given you all sorts of promises. And, and you think of God's covenant with Noah. You think of God's covenant with Abraham. You think of God's lineage through David. And the prophecies through Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. But every covenant and every promise had a bigger promise ahead. And that was of Christ to come. And Paul is telling the Israelites that you, are, you may consider yourself a child of Abraham... But not all of Abraham's children were of the line of Jesus. In other words, Abraham had lots of kids, but only Isaac was the one that had that lineage to Jesus. And he's pointing to Christ here, saying you can't just depend on your lineage, your heritage. It all comes down to if you know Christ. Each promise had a bigger promise ahead of it. And all they had to do was receive that promise receive the son trust and believe in the son there was a missionary named don richardson who ministered to tribes in new guinea and the tribe he went to was called the sawai tribe and they were a violent tribe they were known for head hunting they were known for cannibalism when he went to visit them to tell them about jesus and they were such a bloodthirsty tribe when he spoke the gospel to them they, wor they worshipped and idolized Judas, of all people, in the Gospels. And so he was frustrated in trying to minister to them and was getting ready to leave. And the final straw was when the, the tribe of the Sawai was going to war with another tribe. And he said, that's it, I can't have my family here in the midst of this war. And he packed up his family. And as he was getting ready to leave, the chief of the Sawai tribe said, we want you to stay because good things have been happening since you've been here. What can we do to make you stay? And Richardson said, you need to make peace. I can't raise my family here while there's war going on constantly. And so the chief of the Sawai met with the chief of this other tribe, and they tried to come up with a way for there to be long-lasting peace. And finally, they decided that one child from the Sawai and one child from this other tribe would be exchanged and raised by a family in the opposite tribe. And as long as that child was being loved and cared for, they knew that there would be peace among their two tribes. Automatically, all of the mothers of these children began to worry that it would be their child that would be selected. 
And the time came to exchange the children, and both chiefs of each tribe gave their own child to be exchanged into the other tribe, to be raised by this other tribe, to save their people and keep peace. And Richardson reported that after that, not only was there peace, but also he was able to represent the gospel to them because they had this new picture of someone giving up their son to save their lives. And the gospel spread through that tribe and through that neighboring tribe because they were able to see the love of a heavenly father that gave his precious son to save their lives. And they saw it in the flesh as their own chief, the chief of their tribe gave up his son for their own lives. And that ministry grew throughout New Guinea. Paul tells Israel, all you have to do is accept the promise. You've been receiving these promises for thousands of years, but you've missed the most important one. You need to receive the promise of the Son being given to you. Our third point this morning, I'm going to combine it with the fourth point. Our third point this morning is the goal is to bring God glory. And the fourth point is God will show mercy or favor. Look with me at verse 12. It says, She was told the, other, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What, why, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Paul says to the Israelites, he points out this verse, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. We can read that verse and think, wow, that's harsh. God judged these children before they were even born. And to say that they're loved or hated, Malachi was written 1,500 years after Jacob and Esau were born. And so it, it has the perspective of hindsight, talking about the, the fathers of nations. Jacob was the father of Israel. Esau was the father of the Edomites. And one had God's favor. Jacob had God's favor throughout his life. And Jacob was the second-born son, which in Jewish culture meant he would have been beneath his older brother. The oldest brother was the one who had the position and power in the family. But God chose in his mercy to bless Jacob, to lift him up, to show him mercy, as it says here, where God says, I will show mercy to who I show mercy, and I will show compassion to who I show compassion. And Paul's point is, none of us deserve mercy. All of us deserve judgment. But God chooses some people for this special blessing, to be lifted up, to receive his mercy, like Jacob did. Last week, we kind of highlighted a verse, Romans 8.28. Just turn back maybe one page in your Bible, Romans 8.28. This is the verse that Christina spoke on last week. It says, and we know... For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who were called according to his purpose. Now when we hear that verse, we often remember the first part. God works all things for his good for those who love him. But notice here the last part of that verse. For those who were called according to his purpose. That's what Paul's talking about here. People who were called according to God's purpose. Jacob was called over Esau. Moses was called over Pharaoh. Jesus called three disciples, Peter, James, and John, ahead of the other nine. Paul, of all people, was called to minister to the Gentiles. Jesus called these people for his purpose. And I, I saw a commentator that put it very, very well, that kind of painted the picture for me. He said, there are men in history, in Bible history, that God chose to create a ripple in the world to bring people closer to him. God chose certain people throughout history to cause a ripple that would bring people closer to him. So this morning, I would ask you, if you are in Christ, 
What does that ripple look like in your life? Chances are it begins with your family. Has your family been affected by your faith? And then you, it moves out. Are your grandchildren affected by your faith? Your coworkers affected by your faith? Your neighbors affected by your faith? The people in this church, are they feeling the ripple of, that, of you being called, being chosen by God? Do they feel that ripple of faith? What does that ripple of faith look like in your life? My parents are celebrating their 50th anniversary today, and I was thinking of that image of that ripple being, of going through the water, these different waves. My mom and dad have taught Sunday school, and my mom was my confirmation teacher uh, for 40 years now. They've been Sunday school teachers. And they have kids who are Sunday school teachers. And my brother is a lay preacher up at West Lisbon. And now I have children where Andrew visits 85 shut-ins every day and ministers to them. And Becca leads her Fellowship of Christian Athletes group at the high school. And you just see all these ripples moving out from two people deciding to follow Christ. And so what does that look like in your life? That ripple of faith where God has chosen you and it affects somebody else and it affects someone else and it just keeps going and going and going, bringing him glory. And some of us today might be thinking, well, my ripple isn't that big. It's not that impressive. And Paul actually has an illustration right after this dealing with that, talking about a potter and clay, where the clay isn't one to ask the potter, how come I'm not something more special? You know, the potter has a choice to make a sculpture. He can make something simple like a pot or a a vase. And the clay doesn't get to say what it's going to be. The clay's purpose is to glorify the master, to serve the master. The pot is to hold a plant. The, va- the, the glass or the mug is meant to hold water. The sculpture is meant to be beautiful. But each one is meant to serve the potter. So for each one of us this morning, whether you think that God has called you to something that everyone's going to notice and everyone's going to praise, or maybe God has called you to something simple, humble, useful. The potter has molded you into something very specific for a specific purpose, and that is for you to bring him glory. And that's Paul's message to the Jews in Israel. God has elevated certain people throughout your history, and he says right now he's elevating the Gentiles and using you for another purpose. He even mentions Pharaoh, that Pharaoh's heart has been hardened so that the Israelite, that God could be glorified as the Israelites leave Egypt. Pharaoh's heart being hardened is mentioned 17 times in the book of Exodus. God wanted to make a point of that, that Pharaoh's heart had been hardened so that the Israelites could be freed from captivity all due to God the Father and his might being delivered by his mighty hand. And so we see that in our own lives sometimes. Romans 8, 28, where God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Where there's things in our lives that that aren't the greatest. There's people in our lives that have been hard to deal with. But God used those people to bring us closer to him. I spoke to a young woman this week and she said, what kept me from following Christ for the longest time is my father painted an inaccurate picture of what a loving father was. And she said, I had trouble accepting the love of God the Father because I never had an earthly father to show me love. And then as we talked and she gave her testimony, she said, but my testimony wouldn't be the same if my dad was different. She said, only God could have brought me out of my home life to where I am today. And God hardened my dad's heart towards me. She goes, but I see now that only God could have delivered me from what I grew up in, and I give him all of the praise and glory. There's things in our life that we've been through. Where we re- we w- if we had it to do over again, maybe in our own minds we think, I don't want to go through it that way. I wouldn't want to go through it that way again. But God uses that for his glory, for those that are called according to his purpose. So this morning, I would just ask that you, Pray to the Lord and ask him, Lord, what are you needing me to do for you today? What are you using in my life to bring you closer to you? 
as we come to communion and you have your hands extended in communion to receive the body and the blood of Jesus, I also ask today that you would prayerfully consider extending your hands, asking Jesus, what do you want to give me to do next? What souls am I supposed to be reaching today? What purpose do you have for my life? I am the clay, you are the potter, you have my life, Lord. Would you reveal to me what your purpose is for my life? Because I'm willing to let you mold me into whatever you need me to, to bring you glory. As you extend those hands, let them just be open hands to the Lord to receive from him about what he would do with your life. He wants you to be concerned for souls. He wants you to realize the love that he has for you and to accept his son. He wants your life to bring him glory. And he wants to show you that mercy and favor. Let's pray together. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. And Lord, in humility, we admit we are the clay and you are the potter. And we accept whatever direction you have for our lives. Lord, give us an urgency to want to live that out in our lives today that we want our lives to bring you glory, that we want to bring souls into the kingdom in the name of Jesus. Give us that kind of heart, that kind of humility, that kind of urgency, Lord, that you have given us a purpose. You have called us. We are called according to your purpose, and we thank you for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. to the most important part. And now we come to the most important part and receiving tangibly from Jesus his body and his blood. And before we come together and receive tangibly with our hands outstretched, longing for more of him, Before we come, there's three simple steps that we walk through together in order that we would come together in a worthy manner. The first step is this. I want to ask you to consider, to be willing to go to Jesus right now personally, maybe with your eyes closed, with your heart open, acknowledging and confessing all well, any and all sin to God. Would you do that right now quietly? Any sin, all sin. Anything between you and God, confess it to Him. And the second step, as ones who are willing to acknowledge and confess your sin, As you are approaching Jesus, would you open your heart to receive, your mind, open your mind to receive forgiveness and cleansing through Jesus Christ. Allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away all of your sin. And the third step that we're going to take together is to come forward. And for those of us who are born-again Christians, the third step is receiving tangibly the body and the blood of Jesus. In just a moment, the ushers are going to show you forward. Before they do, I'm going to invite Deacon Darrell, would you come? And he and I are going to receive together with our with our organist, Carol. And while we're doing that, would you take time to do what Gary instructed you to do? Would you, with your heart open, in preparation of coming and receiving, would you just take time with Jesus right now, asking him to reveal today and in the days to come what it is that he wants to give you as he calls you to his purpose? Take quiet time right now.
And let's acknowledge together that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of their sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And I want to invite you to come and receive from Jesus and allow him to continue to call you, call us all to himself, that we would continue to live as people who are called according to his purpose. Amen? Let's come and receive from the Lord.